Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Tony, is this the first time we've done video? I think it is. It's the first time in 15 years that any Word Balloon listeners will know what I look like. <laughs> oh, very exciting. Well, if we should have done this 15 years ago, I had just brown hair. I had a full head of hair. It's much Please. better. Me too, buddy. Don't kid yourself. The man behind In My Life, uh, numerous pony covers and interiors over the years and uh now the uh, co-creator of a really fun very funny and uh, well yeah you'll forgive me if i shouldn't be laughing but a very <laughs> interesting um mashup of uh, genres in a book called stray dogs it's tony fleece everybody welcome hey everybody happy to be here book uh and- not hilarious but the concept is definitely funny like just the it's it's interesting this it is, is not funny. Ha ha! It's funny, strange. And your and your co-creator is uh, watching along with us. Uh, yeah, Pat- Patricia Forstner. How do you do, Patricia? I uh, please uh, come on Word Balloon, and we'll we'll talk about this book as uh, as as the book goes underway. Now it's an image series, Tone. Tell me about yeah. it. Yeah, it's uh, five issues. Uh, I'll just do the pitch uh, so people know what we're talking about. Um, the premise is basically uh, the a serial killer takes. Uh, dogs from his victims as trophies. And this is a story told from the dog's point of view. Um, But the style we're telling it in is sort of like in that 90s animated movie like Balto. um, Secret Secret of Nims, not the 90s, but Secret of Nims style. You know, like a a Don Bluth sort of Fox animation Disney style. It's very specific to the 90s in those cartoons. Um, So yeah, it's, it's like a horror movie told in the, like, as if it was an animated movie. In a comic which is, book. Yeah, which is, I think, a great idea, and um, I look forward to the uh, chilling part of the story when it happens, but, um, <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah, it gets I, grim, for sure. Yeah, and I, well, that's the thing, and honestly, Don, I'm, I'm really amazed, and uh, I, I assume Patricia, obviously, the artist uh, for this? Yeah, Trish. Trish Forstner. Uh, we met through My Little Pony. We both uh, work on the My Little Pony comics. Oh, awesome. Um, and I immediately, when I saw her work, I was just like, this lady's just an incredible cartoonist. Um, and and then when I had the idea for this, I was like, oh, she can draw the crap out of dogs. Uh, so let me talk to her. So we, I got in touch with her very early and was just like, let's make this thing. Well, let's let's play the the trailer for Stray yeah. Dogs, and then uh, a clip. And, yes, it, yeah, exactly. Ah, yeah, yeah. And uh, have they got it in the booth? All right, great. <laughs> all right, uh, let's all sit back and watch uh, Jonathan Winter's new movie, The Love God. <laughs> There we go. It's okay. You're safe now. New 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 dog. 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 New dog.
No. Hey, why can't you see she's afraid? There you go. You're okay. See, I'm Rusty. What's your name? I don't. Sophie. Wait. Do I know you from somewhere? I don't remember. Something happened. Boom. <laughs> That's pretty cool, huh? Man. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. Very impressive tone. No, I like it a lot. Um, well, let's yeah. just keep watching. We can see Stan Lee say the F word. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great word. <laughs> it, it can be a um, verb. It can be a noun. Yeah, one of my buddies is the, is one of the guys that used to record those voice sessions with Stan. And he would he would tell us about that stuff. It's crazy that that tape got out. <laughs> oh no. my god! Great uh, great response so far. Here, let's uh, let's look some of the, some of this stuff. Um, Chad Sook looking at previews of issue one right now. Looks cute but sinister. Exactly. Totally cute agree. And sinister. Yeah. But yes, we'll let the dogs out of super necessity right now. Absolutely. Definitely for the end credits of the comic. And Weesh is right. It's amazingly dark for how cute it is. No, honestly, man, I, I uh the bark is what sells it. Very nice, Trish. I like it. And um yeah, I I that's what I wonder, Tone, honestly, because I love the contrast of Trish's art, and it is so cutesy. That yeah. man, a, a, an adult might accidentally like start reading this to their kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, a buddy of mine, uh, when I sent it to him, he was like, he looked at the first few pages and he was like, "This is beautiful. Can I read this to my kids?" And I was like, well, "Keep reading. I don't like you know." <laughs> de <laughs> depends on the kid, but it's like we're playing it very straight. You know, like it's a, it's a very straight uh, sort of like horror thriller movie, um, but it just looks cute like this and. And sort of the stuff that we're drawing from, like the Don Bluth of it, um, they would do such the like they would have these light movies, but would get very scary. You know, like Secret of Nails sure. got very scary stuff in it. Um, Land Before Time's got crazy scary stuff in it. All of you know, American Tale. Um, yeah. And so we sort of wanted to take that idea and sort of just like ratchet it up to the next, I guess, illogical conclusion, you know, like the, uh, there may be a reason nobody's ever done this before, but uh, it's, it, when I had the idea for it, it was real clear, like, oh, this needs to look just as cute as possible because like one of the things in horror comics is uh, you don't, like in a horror movie, you have like editing and sound and acting and sort of like all the stuff where you get really invested in the characters and you're, you know, like when they're going around the corner and you don't want them to go around the corner, like you're right there with them. And with comics, it's a, you have different tools to work with and using a style like this, you know, like people are immediately invested in these characters, you know, like you see the main character, Sophie, and you're just like, oh, your heart goes immediately out to her. You're like, what a cute dog. And then you're like, oh no, she's in danger. Uh, oh no, you know, so hopefully, yeah. that, hopefully that's how it goes. No, absolutely. Very Hitchcockian. Tone, do me a favor, adjust your microphone, maybe pull it out just a little bit because I'm getting like a get rustle. Whisker. Yeah, and even now I'm still getting it a little bit. It's almost like you're in a wind my, tunnel. It's my fan. There we go. I'll just sweat. With oh, there you go. If you don't mind, yeah, I think it was the fan. Fixed it. All right. Thank this, you, buddy. I'm going to look like Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> <laughs> my, oh, my Just for Men's just going to be streaming down my face. Let's hope not. Absolutely. And I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I don't want you want to be uncomfortable, but yeah, much better. Anyway. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's a great concept. It's uh, very much. And I, um, I think in the press release you sent me good comparisons to black sad and what it mm -hmm. did with noir and, 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 you know, and, uh, and detective stories and stuff, crime stories that uh, you're doing it with horror. Now you guys, I, I think it's a yeah. great idea. I love yeah, it. Um, absolutely. And uh, well, let's see here. Uh, you know, uh, Chandra, is it Chandra or Chanda? Chanda Sook wants to know how you came up with the idea. Uh, I was like, I have a lot of ideas that are, um, I call them like, 
you know what they should have done. You know, like where I'll be watching a thing and I'll be like, oh man, it'd be so much better if they would have done this. Um, and this one, I was watching a, sh- I was watching um, uh, Bates Motel, and uh, I went, I-, I left the room, and then when I came back in the room, uh, Norman Bates had just had a dog, and I was like where did he get this dog from? You know, like I, I missed somehow that he got a dog and I was like, wait, did he kill somebody and take their dog? And then from there, it all sort of just like tumbled into place Very, I was like, Oh, that's a great, you know, and I sort of wrote down uh, what would be the outline for the whole thing pretty quickly from like on that day. But yeah, it's a definitely a, they should have, I wish they would have done that. I don't think he killed the person that took their dog. He just was being nice. Probably. Oh, yeah. Bates. But, yeah. but yeah, when, when you mentioned bits, Motel, that that was my first thought too. Was, this is like very Hitchcockian. Mm-hmm. So Sophie is like you know uh, Grace Kelly right now. Or, yeah, she's you know, blonde pick- too. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, <laughs> that was it. A conscious choice on your guys' part to make Sophie a blonde uh, I, drive? No, I don't think that was. Uh, I mean, we wanted to make her look as soft as possible, so that might have had something to do with it. And then, like we we knew what the other dogs were going to look like to sort of contrast with. But yeah, no, I don't think we were making her okay. uh, Grace Grace Kelly on purpose. <laughs> or it's 101 Dalmatians, like you said, meets Silence of the Lambs. I mean, it's that kind of thing where just all the dogs and everything, and they all have they all have different um, personalities. They absolutely act like dogs. Like I love that scene at the beginning when when she enters the room and they all run over to sniffer because it's the new dog. Of course, you yeah. do that. So, yeah, yeah. but it was great because it really that's where it got Hitchcock in, where she was kind of overwhelmed by the moment and everything. And I thought that was really neat. Yeah, and we get to we play with fun sort of dog stuff in this it, uh it's like when they talk about it's this is a very stupid comparison but it's like when they talk about like representation in comics you know like when you change the like the race or the gender or the, the pov of the main character all of a sudden you have all these new possibilities and in this case i mean it's not like politically important but by changing them into dogs you know like what do dogs know you know like what are they like i always think about when i leave the house do my dogs have any idea what's going on you know like they seem to think that i'm not coming back uh but i'm definitely coming you know so it's just like yes how how do these characters figure out what this thing is when they're working you know it's not like there's a dog who's a scientist they don't use their hands you know we're sort of working on like bambi rules like they just know what animals know i'm hip and uh, and also short-term memory which i really like the idea of too and then again like you said i mean yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think Seinfeld used to always do it about dogs, and it's true. You walk in the door, it's like, he's back! I didn't think he was coming <laughs> exactly. back! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, it's 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 funny. You know, yeah, and, and I think that's perfect for a murder mystery. And as, you know, they start peeling the onion. I mean, we know what's going on, but they don't know what's going on, so. Right. Yeah, it's like, it's like Memento, right? Like, uh, the, the premise Absolutely. of the book is that, is that dogs' memories only go on for so long. They remember important stuff, but they don't remember like what happened on Tuesday, you know? So in, in this way, like they can forget about important stuff or, you know, like if they witness a murder, they might not remember it for their whole life or, or whatever, or it might go into their, the recesses of their memory. So let's, yeah, show, it's, it's fun uh, to play with. let's show some of Trisha's art here. I'm going to yeah go back and I've got uh, the first issue I think set up here and I'll just scroll down. But yeah, I mean, there she is. There's Sophie. So, a little back matter. But, yeah, you can see, man. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, I guess front matter in this case. But, yeah, that's yes. great, man. And th- all this stuff is real. Um, it, so, we collaborate on it. The Like, the process of making this book has been so cool for me. Um, just because, like, me and Trish work really closely together. Uh, and then we also, uh, my buddy Tone Rodriguez is doing layouts for us. Cool. Um, and so we work closely with him too. It's just sort of like um, all of us have hands on it uh, all, all the time, you know, where we're just like, oh, maybe we tweak this or Trish will be like, uh, you know, the, the colors on these spots are wrong, uh, you know, because all the dogs have these specific like spot patterns and stuff. And so we're yeah. always sort of just, like tweaking and, and poking on it. And we've been working on it for so long just because it's been sort of like a side job for us up until now. Uh, where like I'll be working on ponies or she'll be working on ponies. And then in between we'll try and get as much pages out as we can. Uh, so we've been working on it for like t- two years now, I think um, where we've just been sort of like s- stacking pages up and trying to get as much done as possible. Um, I've got the process stuff. If you want to see, please. Yeah. Let's, let's try this screen share. See how it goes. All right, buddy. No, I'm very impressed. I, I really, I thought it was a, 
it, it pulls you right in. The art is very inviting. And uh, yeah, I like the, I like the juxtaposition of the uh, cute stuff. All right, here it is. You can see this. All right. So this oh, yeah. is the lineup. This is sort of like one of the first things that, uh, that me and Trish did. Uh, all, I mean, all the artwork is by Trish, uh, but we sort of definitely went back and forth and did like make this dog uglier or make this dog cuter or, you know, like, and sort of like working with what their personalities are going to be. Um, I've got like early sketches and stuff too, but here's sort of what the process looks like. Like uh, this is what we'll get from tone. Like I'll send him, sometimes I'll send him like a thumbnail uh, mm -hmm. and, and then I send him a script and then he sends back, he just sends pictures on his, on his phone. Like he's sort of a low tech. So he'll just take a picture of a page and text it to me. And then we'll sort of format it. We'll take that stuff and format it into uh, like here, you see, we changed the bottom panel. We're like, oh, it'd be easier if we just did a close up and more effective. Sure. And then since Trish just works all digital, like once we get this, I can just put it on Dropbox and then she'll ink over top of that. Um, wow. And then, and then we send it to our flatter Lauren and then she sends it to Brad uh, Simpson, who's our colorist. And then he does, uh, does the final colors on it. So yeah, we, I got a few of those tone does the layout and then Trish does the inks over top and then colors by Brad. And wow. And flat one. Pretty yeah. neat, right? No, this it's one gorgeous, here, man. Go ahead. This is like a, like a thumbnail that I did. So this one, I had like a real specific, I want it to look like this. So I sent this to Tone and then he did over top, like did a blue line over top of it. Funny. And then Trish, you can see like. Yeah. Trish, we sort of, as this is the first issue, and as the book went on, we stopped putting really any detail in the dog. So we're just like, we just want what you're going to do 100%. Like, we don't want any sort of, uh, to have any influence on it. So so we stopped doing even, like, even that detail, the dogs, those Brad's colors. And and the, <laughs> the theory we have with the colors is that all the backgrounds get rendered, and then the dogs are all flat so that it looks like cell shading, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it, it sort of looks like one of those, I mean, not cheap, but like uh, it, it was expensive when they started doing the shadows on characters in like Roger Rabbit and stuff. And so before that, like all the cartoons just had flat colors. So that's what we're doing here. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that. Very impressive, dude. Well done. Um, do I, I was going to say, all right, I'll move it off. Um all right, and also now uh, Chad Asuk uh, says that he read or she read that Paramount Animation picked up the rights to this. Congratulations! How long ago was that? How much input did you guys have on the adaptation? Uh, yeah, that was in September. They announced it. Um, how much? Uh, we're not super involved in like in what the what the movie is going to be. Like, if, if there's a movie right now, basically we've optioned it, and they're in. Um, development they'll develop it and sort of try and put like a pitch together or script together and then if paramount decides like oh let's do it then uh, then they'll buy it and they'll actually make a movie so now it's like very cool but but i'm i'm like cautiously optimistic sure um but i have uh, a little bit of like we're consultants on the on the movie which i don't know i think that means like as much or as little as we want it to mean when like if that if that gets up and going um, but the producer on the movie is one of my best friends uh, out here. And that's why it, it sold so long before the thing was even announced, you know, because it seems very bizarre that <laughs> like the comic's not even out and then already there's, there's stuff going on with it. Uh, but one of my best friends, Gary, uh, from when I moved out here to LA, uh, like we would, we were just sort of like all young creative people that would hang out and, and we're all sort of like on the come up, like all starting to do our thing. Yeah. Uh, and, as I sort of went on into comics and started working a lot uh, in like, you know, uh, licensed comics and, and stuff like that, Gary started, he, he had been doing like uh, sci-fi channel movies and rewrites and stuff. Um, and then he wrote Annabelle, uh, which was like wildly successful. Uh, and then yeah. he wrote all three of those Annabelles. And then off of this, like the success of that, he wrote uh, it which is like the number one horror movie in the history of time. <laughs> so, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> that worked out well for him. Uh, I and so, when I, yeah. And I, I saw him at Comic-Con a couple of years ago, and I told him the, like, the idea that I had for this, and he was just like, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. 
Uh, and so he's been like way on board since before the thing even he was like whenever you like whenever you're ready with this like i want to you know talk to my people about it talk to the guys so yeah so that was super cool uh stuff like that has never happened to me before uh so but uh it's nice because it sort of gives us a little bit of um wiggle room to work on this and to work on other creator own stuff you know like yeah uh, I de- like I don't think either of us are definitely trying to jump over and make, you know, to be, you know, go Hollywood, but the, the extra money is nice, especially in creator own comics that you can sort of have a, uh, a little bit of a cushion to work on stuff. Cause yeah, otherwise it's just like, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise it's just like, I make ponies enough to pay the rent and then I have to make more ponies. This way I can sort of like tinker a little bit and get some more stuff going in the meantime. That's excellent. Tom. No, seriously, it's a great idea. And Wonderful execution by Utrecht and Company. I, I think uh, I think you're onto something, and I'm glad you got a guy that uh, is is thinking beyond the comic as well, because this is a it's a no brainer that this would make a great movie. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, the the funny thing is that we drew it to look like a movie because we thought like, well, no one would ever make this movie, you know, like sure, like make it look like one of those '90s animated things because they would never make an animated movie of this. And then, but then the deal that they made is to make a, you know, like if they buy it and they decide to do it, like it's to be to look like this, like they want it to look like an, an animated 2D animated cartoon. So that's crazy. And also, just again, I love how creative people have been in horror. I mean, for years now. And I mean, you know, Blumhouse and uh, yeah. God, that uh, even that stupid sci fi channel, Banana Splits parody. <laughs> Did you I see, it? see this one. No. Are you aware of it I'm, or no? I'm not of the Banana Splits generation. So that's I, true. I, I can see how it would have zipped past me. But I like that you saw it. Well, tell me about it. It was, uh, <laughs> it was like if like the robots at Chuck E. Cheese went berserk and were killing people. Because it's like a kid show oh, okay. with animatics, uh, you know, animatronics. Yeah, animatronics, whatever. yeah. Animatronics. And something happens and they they, they all get blood bloodthirsty and, like, you know, it's during the taping of a show. Now, the original Banana Splits was just, you know, guys in, guys in costumes and stuff yeah, introducing sure. cartoons. But I just love the idea and everything. And, yeah, I mean, they... They, you know, put put an axe in Fred Flintstone's hands and st- have him start chopping people <laughs> up. It's basically what it was like for me watching the Banana Splits. I was like, okay, <laughs> yeah. So I'm- no, but I, I really, I think that's great. And again, I really hope this happens because I'd love to see a film studio go there, yeah, and 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 really make something like this. And I and I think there's, boy, it's going to cause a lot of buzz. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. I even think a comic like this again in the wrong in the in the wrong hands of you know mom or dad not paying attention it's like yeah mommy why are the dogs dying <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> listen all the dogs don't die uh, i just want to get people ready okay. ahead of time like the, uh, <laughs> they're definitely in danger but i'm very uh, i mean and they're and some might not make it but i'm i'm concerned that people are just gonna be like is this still a book like a snuff film about dogs like they just introduce <laughs> us to cute dogs and then just murder them all uh which is not that, but I mean, three words, dog snuff film. <laughs> you had me at a low. But it is crazy. like, it does play by the rules of a horror movie. So it's like, you know, like these dogs are in danger. They might not all survive. Like you, you people are, should be on the edge of their seats. You know, uh, it's definitely, I'm definitely interested to see how it plays because I've, I like, uh, I am like a horror movie guy. Like I'm not like a, like a jean jacket with like a, Texas Chainsaw Massacre patch on the back of it, horror movie with like a beard and a stocking hat. But I definitely like consume mostly horror movies. And so I feel like my, uh, like what I think is appropriate might be skewed. So I'm definitely interested to see how this plays with the, with the public, with the general public. That's it. Well, so, you know, that's, this reminds me of my conversations with, with Tim Seeley. You know, it's that, it's that kind of oh, thing. You guys are, you guys are cut from that same cloth. We, sh- we totally are. Weesh says, to be honest, I hate watching horror. I don't like the tension. Reading it is a lot better because I can just read it faster or skip ahead if things start to get intense. So yeah. I think we'll be all right with this, though, Weesh. I got to tell you. Yeah, you should be okay. I mean, it's going to get intense, but you're you're in charge of the pacing. So, you know, just skip pages if you feel like it. You know, only maybe you read a couple. You don't want to read the third or fourth. That's fine. No, just give it a shot. Or That's don't. awesome. Or steal it off the internet. You know, it's whatever whatever feels comfortable for you. When uh, when does this start coming out? 
Uh, it's in previews now. Uh, it just went in previews, uh, and it comes out on February seventeenth. Okay, uh, so it's in the December so yeah. previews. Yeah, so yeah, it's just it's just out to order last week. Like we just started Great. promoting it, and we're sending stuff around, and we're talking about all sorts of uh, like incentive covers and retailer stuff, and all all the Good. the business stuff that we hadn't yeah. uh, that we hadn't even considered until now. You know, it seems like, uh, and again, I'm I'm in a very fortunate city that has so many different comic shops and they do a great job of covering all genres. How is this uh, getting to the local stores and everything? Are they, does it, you know, do you have a good buzz uh, uh, for it? The buzz seems to be pretty good. Yeah. Um, I went to comics pro, which is like a retailer uh, meetup, like yeah. retailers all get together and it's like a, like a business convention for them and all the publishers go out and talk to them about like what's coming. Um, and, and, uh, creators can go and just sort of pitch their stuff to them. Uh, and I, when I would pitch this to, to retailers, almost to a one, they were like, Oh, we could totally sell that. Cause it, like, it is a pretty easy pitch, you know, like yeah. if you have people that, that like dogs and like, you know, like horror movies or, or like true crime people or whatever, like that's an easy pitch to them. Cause it's just like, it's a serial killers, uh, has a bunch of dogs and they're trying to f figure out what's going on. You know, like that's a very, uh, nondescript pitch but you know like you can give it to them you know I, i'm working on the pitch but i feel like it's easy enough for a retailer to go like this is for you you would dig this and we're sending out a bunch of uh like posters and flyers to retailers next week that they can put in people's hold files and stuff and just hopefully make their sort of uh more um like their murdery, their crimey customers aware that this is coming because it's you know, I'm like neither Trish or I are names that that you would be like, oh, I want to read his horror comic. So it's definitely something where there's a little bit of a leap of faith. I understand, but again, I think um, the fact that uh, Trish's art is so inviting, and that if people do hear the pitch and stuff, uh, yeah, I think you'll get them. I think you'll get them, Tone. Honestly, yeah, Tone, you know, I get a lot of I get a lot of stuff from a lot of people. And uh, I read through it or whatever, but this absolutely uh, is one of those exceptional, wait a minute, totally holding my attention. And uh, yeah, I really, I found myself, again, you were kind enough to send me the first three issues. And it's like, I really was like, oh, what happens next? I mean, I, the anticipation yeah. for me was real. So that's oh, really that's great, man. Yeah, we tr uh, like we really hammered down um, like the outline and the like the plot is super tight and we made sure that every issue is like a ends in a cliffhanger and we want to pick it up and read what's next, you know? And so like, we were really, we didn't want to leave anything to chance and sort of like, I, I knew that this was a, not a once in a lifetime, but like, it's my most commercial idea that I've had, you know? I so agree I was just you. like, let me make sure that I just get this as perfect as possible. And that's why I've been so happy working with Trisha just because like that part, is handled, you know, like it's always going to look beautiful. That's all right. Like that's half the battle. And then the rest is just sort of like making sure that, you know, the, the scares are on the page turns and the cliffhangers are there and the characters are, you know, like the, you, you fall in love with the characters or you hate the characters, or, you know, so it's, it's been, uh, I, like I said, we've been working on it for two years. So it's like my most considered work, you know, like <laughs> I've sort of gone over it with a fine tooth comb, which means there will definitely be typos when the first issue comes out. <laughs> uh, we'll definitely have misspellings and stuff. So. No, no. You know, and I agree with Weesh. I've never gotten a notice in my hold files. That's kind of a cool way to hear about a new, a new series. Typically they just tell me in person if there's something they think I'd be interested in. Yeah. I, I hadn't heard of that either. Is that something that you picked up from other friends that are creators and stuff and do that kind of thing? Um, I think I heard about that from retailers uh, mm. just because I was like, like I said, I went to this comics pro thing and I talked to them a lot about like, what, what can I do to help you sell this to your customers? You know, sure. just, like sure. we want as many people as possible to read it. So like, how can I, uh, how can I help? And I feel like somebody had mentioned that now, like if I send them out and they just get a stack of flyers and they put them by the counter, that's cool too. But in the, sure. you know, I'll just put a little letter that says like, you know, give this to your specific customers um, we're gonna we're talking about doing some little sketches that we can put in that'll just be like the shop can give to you know one of the people that orders the book or you know just trying our best to to make to make sure this is as easy as possible for people to to get a hold of which being an image is really help helps a lot too because every, most every shop orders image number ones you know 
That's true. Absolutely. Is um, five issues? I mean, limited series, obviously, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a contained story. There's five issues. Um, we've got like a, a zero issue or an annual that we'd like to do, but it's sort of contingent on how the first couple issues do. You know, like is it worth it for us to do another? Because uh, it's sort of like extra stuff. Like if there's enough uh, people out there that would want to know like what happened with these dogs before, or what are other stories with these dogs, like that's out there. Um, so we're sort of It'll definitely be five issues. We're right now working on the Trisha's finishing up the fourth issue, and I'm writing the fifth. Uh, and we're hoping to have the inks done for the whole thing basically by the time the first one ships or around there. So, yeah, it's a, it's just like a contained five issue thing. That's great, man. Um, yeah. yeah, and then Trish likes the idea of uh, having the notices as well. The idea of having a handout that tells me about the series. Yeah, man, I think that's that's really a great idea. Here, I'll show it to you. It's uh, I use Comic Sans, which I thought was like the only chance I would have to use Comic Sans. I know people get annoyed about it, uh, but I think it's funny. And then Trish made this. I'll show you this poster that Trish made too. That's badass. Super. Please. Cool. Uh, let me find this thing. Do we Stray have dogs, everybody. <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat it for uh, my audio audience as we're waiting for images on the video side but uh, and again it starts in february um through image and it's in the current uh, december issue of previews oh yeah and we're doing um horror movie variant covers too uh so every issue Funny. comes with a with a variant cover where it's like our dogs on a classic horror movie uh poster <laughs> the first one silence of the lambs and then we're doing uh, one for every subsequent issue so that's pretty fun here we go that's hilarious so, share screen, application window. Here we go. My entire screen. No problem. You're about to see the, is it happening? Not yet. I'm standing by. There we go. Yep. Yeah. So we made like this missing dog poster. Yes. Um, and those will be printed on like colored paper, you know, like a real, <laughs> like a real missing dog flyer. And then sure. it's got all the info to order order the book on there and then <laughs> Trish did this promo poster that looks wow. like this. Yeah. Yeah. Real like, you know, VHS uh yeah. like direct to video VHS vibes. Uh <laughs> super beautiful. Very um, nice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So those are going out to shops uh, next week. They're printing today. So we'll be I'll be sending out a bunch of packages. Very cool. Yeah. That's awesome, exciting. man. Very exciting. Well done, dude. Thanks, dude. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's Stray Dogs. You want to talk about anything else? What's going on you with you? You tell me what's going on, man. What have you What have you seen lately? I'm too behind on Mandalorian. Okay. I heard great things about the last two episodes. Yeah. Uh, and that, man, I'll tell you, and you know, you know me with Star Trek. I can't help it. <laughs> oh, my God. Star Trek moments. Let's go. Uh, I, you know, well, yeah, absolutely. You know, the... Uh, Last episode was on Thanksgiving, and knowing that I had that big Batman event that we did on Friday night, I was just like, um, "All right, I don't, I, I won't have time for Star Trek." And then I watched the episode, and it's the most infuriating episode they've made <laughs> so far. So I'll, we'll, uh, we'll have that. You know, I may as well do do some uh, advertising of other uh, Word Balloon Lives on Thursday. New Discovery review, and we'll just review the the two most recent episodes with uh, Mitch and. And Franco, you're not watching. You're not a Star Trek guy. I am a, uh, I'm a Star Wars guy, so I'm sure. Star Trek, you know, on the fringes a little bit. Uh, and I, I understand. just, I have CBS All Access. I pay for it every month for the Good Fight. Uh, oh, great! <laughs> which I watch, you know, like sure nine weeks out of a year, and then I pay for it the other uh, fifty weeks. I haven't been. I haven't been keeping up with it. I really love the first season. Is yeah. Niambe still on it? Niambe, Niambe. Yeah, yeah, comic book guy. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say you you've met him before at, at shows, haven't you? Yeah, for sure. No, I met him I met him at a party uh, at Cena Grace's place out here. Oh, fun. Um, I I never go anywhere and then the one time I, me and Shannon went out to a, to Cena Grace's place and he had just people comic book people over and Nyambi Nambi there. Super nice guy. And then I just Great run guy. into him at, at comic stores and stuff. I ran into him at Star Wars convention. 
we see each other around. We bump into each other for sure. Awesome. Very cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I good. That's good to hear. Yeah, I've got all access too. And and I'll say that when I'm not watching Star Trek, I like some of the reruns on there. They got Taxi oh, I know on you there. Do. They, got yeah. Odd, they, they got Odd Couple on there. They got Classic Perry Mason. So oh, you know what? Nine I, seasons of Rinber. Go on. You know, you know what I saw that I think you would super dig, but I don't Talk like to you. Me. Do you have Shutter? You don't. You don't care. I about don't Shutter. have Shutter. No. You know, I'm not. A, I gotta say, and honestly, guy. I'm not a horror guy, and that's yeah. another reason why I'm so pleased to have read this and go. This is great. So yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not the biggest horror guy, and I'm like, no, this is a really good story. So, well, issue, but tell me what's on Shutter though, anyway, for the rest of the audience. Uh, issue four of Stray Dogs is our definitely like this is a horror movie issue. So we'll see how you're doing uh, after we get to that <laughs> one. Uh, but Shudder just put up this documentary uh, about William Freakin um, making the Exorcist? The Exorcist. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's not really a documentary so much as it's just like a long form interview with him. And then they cut in a bunch of uh, footage from The Exorcist. But it's so great. Like He's I said, I, I was telling. Uh, Fialkov that it's maybe one of my favorite things I've ever seen about art just because he's so tenacious and he was just like you know uh, uh, we hired Lalo Schifrin to do the score and I came in and he played a little bit of it and I was like this isn't what I want at all and then he was like oh uh, well what do we want to do uh, and he was like well we're not going to do it and he just left he's like I haven't talked to him since like he, wow. he hasn't talked to Lalo Schifrin since uh, they talked to um, Michael Field uh, no, Bernard Herman. Is it Bernard Herman? Dead. <laughs> I yeah, would no, assume dead. Obviously, he's dead now for sure. I mean, when they were making the exercise. Oh, I see. Yeah, he probably he probably was still alive. That makes sense. And he went to him, and Friedkin had like a very specific uh, idea of what the thing was supposed to be. And uh, Bernard Herman was like, "Yeah, just leave it with me, and I'll just you know like I'll put some stuff on it." And he was like, well, leave it with you. No, like <laughs> we got to work on this together. And he was like, no, nah, I don't do that. And he was like, all right, well, we're not doing that. So it was, he was just very determined. He had a, a like a very clear idea about what the thing was. And obviously, like, you know, people were injured on that thing. And, you know, like uh, uh, so it was not like a safe like he talks about, like firing guns off on the set to get people to be shocked. And like he slapped the guy in the face to get his, you know, like it was serious, like hardcore uh, movie making, but to me, like, I'm not gonna slap Trish in the face to get the right uh, reaction <laughs> out of her, but just like the I hope not. we we live on opposite sides of the country, otherwise, it would just be a, a slap festival all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like, uh, just the like the persistence, and like, he had a vision, and he was just like, This is what I'm gonna do now. He's, he's a genius. Yes. So, like, his vision was obviously the right idea. That, that sort of tenacity in the wrong hands could, you know, makes all sorts of stupid nonsense. Oh, 100%. Uh, but it was very inspiring. And then also just, like, he talked a lot about um, the grace note in film. Like, he, he talked a lot about Citizen Kane and how just, like, you know that scene where um, dude talks about seeing that girl that he thinks about her every day. He saw yes. her for a second. Yes. Has Bernstein. nothing to do with yeah, yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do with the plot. It has nothing to do with anything, yep. but it's just like this beautiful little thing that sits there in the middle of that thing. And he called that like a grace note in that film. And he talked about like putting stuff like that. And that's the sort of stuff like I try to do that. <laughs> uh, obviously not comparing myself to the guy, but like I think about that sort of thing. Like this would be a nice little thing. It doesn't, it doesn't add anything, but it doesn't detract. And then I talked to like uh, other storytelling friends and like people that make stuff. Uh, and uh, we sort of talked about that idea that like you just have to have your skeleton that you hang the thing on, you know, like he had this thing very specific, what he wanted and everything. But then when it's time to do a little bit of improvising or have a little bit of fun, like, you know, you can put in these sweet, nice little things and just have it, you know, sit there. And that's what makes something unique and not, uh, you know, just like a, you know, like a straightforward, you know, Oh, that was fine. That was a good movie. I, I won't remember it you know three weeks from now right no i get it and and also uh the versatility of uh, freakin when you consider french connection and exercise oh, yeah. and you know uh god you know in the 90s um i hung out a lot and i'm sure i've told you this before and it's probably come up on the podcast but uh, william peterson would hang out at our sports talk yeah. station and he always had great stories and at one point um showtime remade 12 angry men and Freakin directed it. 
And it was all, it, it, it started with Jack Lemon because back in the 50s, for people who don't know, 12 Angry Men, classic 1950s courtroom movie directed by Sidney Lumet. Henry Fonda was the guy that got the option on it and he beat Jack Lemon in getting the option for this thing. And it always pissed Jack Lemon off. He really wanted to be that same role that Henry Fonda played. So finally in the 90s, he got to do the movie and oh, they wild. and they peppered it with like another all-star cast. Courtney B. Vance was in it. Um uh uh what's his face? Patton. Um uh George, oh God, C. Scott. George, C., George C. Scott was the Lee J. Cobb role, the main guy. He's guilty. He's obviously guilty. Yeah. Fantastic. And Lemon kind of played the Fonda role, but obviously was a bit older. So he and Courtney Vance kind of uh split the Fonda role in a lot of ways. But Tony Danza was in it. Um, and, and Bill Peterson was in it too. And, uh, and it was directed by Friedkin and he was all excited, uh, Bill, because Bill's a Chicago guy, Friedkin's a Chicago guy. So they were really excited to, and, uh, and they, uh, had worked together too on, um, right. To live in, yeah. To live and die in LA. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like kind of homecoming and everything, but yeah, so he, you know, yeah, he, you know, I never got to meet Friedkin, but he would tell me great Friedkin stories and everything. And uh, yeah, so uh, I, I I just have tremendous respect for Friedkin. Plus, he was just on Gilbert got either Gilbert Gottfried or maybe Mark Maron. But I didn't know uh, he had been directing operas for like the last oh, several sense. years, which I thought yeah, really that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, and he, like he's very uh, erudite. Like he he he's a guy that knows about art and culture and stuff like that. You can yeah. tell that immediately. Yeah. Started in local news here in Chicago, making documentaries and, and news features um, oh, before shit. making films. Yeah, man, no, really interesting career. So uh, no, I you see, I would watch that. I would, uh, you know, I mean, that's I gotta find, yeah. you know, somebody like yourself that's got Shutter or whatever, and see if we can uh, we can stream sure trade. Find a way. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, oh, you know what I just saw today uh, on Showtime, the Belushi documentary. Oh, it's, I heard it's good. It's good. It's really good. Really, cool. really good. And it's interesting. I if, and, go ahead. I wonder if Showtime still has that 12 Angry Men. I, I, their app is very, uh, is not intuitive. So it might be on there in some corner or something. Yeah, I don't know. And then the other one I saw on Showtime, I still have to see the Go Go's documentary, but I watched the oh, whole time. Yeah, that looked great too. Bendis has been raving about that to me. Yeah. So, and it's, and it, and it's funny. I've been watching so many other things and I'm like, yeah, I got to get back to Showtime. I haven't watched anything on Showtime in a while. So I want to watch that. Um, and uh, and then, you know, I've just been rating uh, Amazon Prime for great documentaries. And I saw the Hal Ashby documentary, and I thought that was excellent. And uh, the one about Pauline Kael, mm -hmm. I thought that was really great. And I'm excited for the Netflix Mankiewicz movie. Oh, that looks incredible. So. There's a there's an uh, Amazon Prime one about uh, a drive-in. Have you, have you seen that one go by? Like, have you seen the, the icon for that? If you watch movie the, documentaries, it comes through. Is that the, uh, that's the one just about uh, like a, a new, uh, a drive-in that's like kind of restored or whatever? And Yeah, yeah. It's like a small town drive-in that these guys like decide to, you know, decide to get up on its feet and make it into like a repertory theater, you know, or they start showing, you know, like it's not like they're showing, uh, Gabe Hardman type, you know, like obscure, cool movies, but you know, like they'll show like, you know, gremlins and stuff or like, sure. you know, stuff that, you know, people, uh, nostalgic stuff. Uh, yeah. but it's super fun just to like, as far as like seeing people get excited about movies and like handling it there, like in an interesting way. They, and there's like a super nerdy situation where they, they had been using the original projector and then they had an issue with it and they had to rig up, uh, to just play off of like a DVD, but it's a huge screen. So you can't just use like the projector from inside your house or, you know, sure. you would use in a school. And so they had to rig it, like stack these three projectors on top of each other and like focus them all at the same, you know, like uh, registration. And it's very nerdy, but wow. very, like in the, in the context of the documentary, it's thrilling. Cause you're just like, is he going to match it up? Is it going to work? It worked. So that's what outstanding. No, that sounds really cool, man. Yeah, That's recommend. hilarious. I think it's I, called uh, just driving. I'll have to check that out. I love the Tower Records one that uh, yeah. Tom Hanks's kid made. I yeah. thought that was excellent. Um, Not Chet, the other one. 
Yeah, not yeah. The not the one Jamaican, not his Jamaican son. <laughs> the uh I'm trying to think of one else. Uh so those are the that that's the obvious stuff I've watched lately. It's funny you mentioned Gabe. Uh I have been watching a ton of uh noir uh stuff. And um we had uh, Eddie Muller on Word Balloon a couple Tuesdays ago. Oh neat. It was amazing, you know. Um yeah, Mike you freaking out. It was fantastic. Well, you know, it was actually Gabe wasn't on it. It was me, Mike Cronenberg, who art directs uh, the Noir City magazine, and then also mm -hmm. uh, does my favorite boxing magazine, Ringside Seat. And uh, he put us together, and he's like, "Hey, you know, Eddie loves comics, and any, you know, and he, his dad was like the best boxing uh, writer for San Francisco in in his era." And I'm like, "Oh Jesus, you know, that's that's a triple head, you know, come on, that's three boxes right there. I got to yeah. talk to this guy." But yeah, it was a lot of fun, and it was so funny because Mike's like, "Hey, you know, we're raising funds for Noir City. Can can we primarily talk about Noir?" I'm like, "Of course, I love old movies. I love Noir movies. That's fine." And he's like, "Thank God I get to talk comics. I never get to talk comics." So right. He stayed, he stayed another hour just to talk about comics. It was fantastic. But yeah, we had a blast. It was really fun. And I've been uh, not only um, I don't know what kind of digital channels you have in your area, um, but we have um, one that's just called Movies. And they play a ton. They play movies from the '90s and '80s and 2000s as well. But usually, they, their bread and butter are the old black and white films. And on Thursdays and Sundays, in particular, they do noir films. And oh my God, what an education! I see so many great movies that I wouldn't have normally seen, and uh, and discover all these starlets that came and went. There was a one. Her name was Cleo. Was it Cleo James? Something like that. The movie was called Overexposed. And she's this platinum blonde, you know, third third tier Mamie Van Doren. Yeah. So go Marilyn, Jane Mansfield, Mamie Van Doren, three more, and then and then you hit Cleo James. And I mean, she was good. I mean, she was a fine enough actress. I guess she married a real estate guy and got out of the business while she was still young. But it's her. Yeah, I and, love, you know. I love uh, finding people like that where you're just like watching a movie and then there's like this stunning new person you. You know, you never heard from again. You never saw before. I'll I'll find that watching uh, noir films like that, where then I'll IMDb them and I'll find like you know, I have to have a connection. Like I I won't just grab another movie they were in because I'm like this is probably you know <laughs> this could be a one off. Uh, but if they like were in something that was written by somebody that I trust or that like has you know some other sort of cosign, I'll usually grab that one too and check it out. And then I'll just have like this sort of like connect the dots of where I'm like, why do I have this? Uh, you know, like, why, why do I have this DVD? And I was like, oh, it's got that one girl from that one movie that was so good. Uh, yeah. That's what happened with uh, Mueller the night before. They were uh, all month they were doing, and in fact, they might even be doing it tonight, the last night, uh, Shelley Winters on Turner Classic Movies. And there was this 50s color movie she made called Tennessee Champ, a boxing movie. And it was Keenan Wynn who's always the bad guy in all the uh, Fred McMurray flubber movies. Right. And, and he's, he's a fight manager and Shelly Winters is his girl. And uh, this guy, Dewey Martin, who I've barely heard of is like this bohunk that it's, it's your classic, like, Hey, I don't box, but I can really hit. So they turn him into a boxer and all of a sudden he becomes a contender. But um, Bronson, Charles Bronson's in the movie. It's a very early pre house of wax, Charles Bronson movie, which is interesting. But it was yeah. written, it was, as you were saying, describing some of the films you pick up, it was written by the guy who did the setup, which is like the best noir boxing movie, Robert Ryan, fantastic yeah. film. And it was directed by the guy that directed Forbidden Planet. And in fact, Earl Holloman from Forbidden Planet, who's kind of the goofball crewman that uh, Robbie the Robo Robot makes all the bourbon for. You know, oh, okay. Would, you know, would 72,000 gallons be sufficient? So, <laughs> you know. Right. He's he's a he's kind of a knucklehead boxer in this movie, and it was this weird like seventy minute you know bottom half of a double feature kind of movie, but it was fascinating. I I saw it. I never need to see it again, but it was really interesting to see. And then reading about it and going, oh wait a minute, the guy who directed Forbidden Planet directed this. That's cool. So it was kind of interesting. I just watched uh, my my Halloween like horror movie. Uh, the like the bent that I was on, I've just sort of stayed on that since then. Like I'm just like I don't have to stop this, uh, but I've been like dipping back into stuff like old stuff that I liked. 
uh, and checking out new stuff. Um, and I watched a few of those Masters of Horror because I got like on yes. a, on a, on a Dario Argento kick, and I was like, oh, I never saw those Masters of Horror he did. And they were fine. I mean, they might be like the last super like pr pretty good Dario Argento's. Uh, but then when in, in like my Halloween watch, I rewatched this movie that I remember really liking uh, called The Sadist. Okay. Uh, and it's black and white. Um, and it's a super low budget, and it stars this guy. I don't know if you know him. But his name is Arch Hall Jr. Do you know him? I do know that name. I'm sure if I saw a photo, I'd recognize him from Black his, and White. Like from far away, look he up. looks like a he looks like a beach like a beach hunk, like a you know like a beach blanket bingo type of guy. But sure. when you get closer, he's just got this fucked up face, uh, and he's just like <laughs> looks sadistic. Um, and his dad was rich, like he was a businessman and he was trying to put his son in, like he was trying to make him, put him in these like beach blanket guitar movies. Um, and he, he would do those, he would like, you know, be in bands and stuff in these movies. Uh, and then they were, they were like, well, let's try him in this thing. And he, it's a movie about, um, yeah, there he is. Looks handsome <laughs> enough, but if you get closer, he looks crazy. Um, <laughs> Jeez, and the, there he is as an old the, man. There you go. He looks better as an old man. But in The Sadist, he uh, it's a movie about like these three teachers are on their way to see a baseball game, and they get into car trouble, so they pull off to get you know, like an, get their car looked at at this uh, mechanic, like this roadside mechanic, you know, just like this dusty lot. Uh, and when they get there, this guy, Arch Hall Jr., and his like creepy... Um, natural born killers type girlfriend have already killed the people at the uh, okay. the garage. And then they just come and start terrorizing these three teachers. And it's like, it's basically just like they chase these, these teachers around this, uh, this lot for, you know, an hour. Uh, but it's great. Like it's super intense. And, uh, and all the performances are like super believable. And this guy, like you're, I, I was just like, this is a person that was just born to do this thing. Like he did this one, great thing and then you know sometimes you just got one i assume he probably has some other good ones out there but this one i can't imagine a more perfect person fitting into a more perfect thing that's the hilarious sadist. all right good to know very good and yeah I, I, there was one i saw it was either called the gangster or the mobster and it takes place like a coney island uh neptune city i assume that's like kind of coney island uh area of new york yeah but, i know I mean, what it looks like but yeah, it was a really interesting, like little noir, and he, he, uh, Harry Morgan from uh, Mash and Dragnet was in it as a young man. You're saying you're saying it's called either the gangster or the mobster. Yeah. No. I'd have to look it up. I mean, I could probably but, figure that out. We'll yeah, get, we'll get to the bottom of it later. Look up <laughs> word balloon watchers. Check out the gangster or the mobster. <laughs> or the mobster. It's one of the two. I think it's Very mobster. Google. I think it's mobster. But uh, yeah, no, it's uh, again. I, I I love discovering these movies, and you know sometimes they're poverty row, but a lot of times they are like MGM or Columbia, and they were just you know they were making them too. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting, you know. I, my favorite, I always bring it up because I love Ricardo Montalban, not just because he was Armando in the Planet of the Apes movies, but he made he made an early fifties movie that John Sturges directed. Actually, he made two John Sturges movies very early in Sturges's directing career. Uh, Sturgis directed everybody uh, Magnificent Seven and Great Escape among his great 60s films. He direct, he started directing Le Mans for uh, Steve McQueen, but they had a falling out uh, during the film. But he really made McQueen a star in uh, Magnificent Seven and Great Escape. But uh, uh, he made a movie called uh, Mystery Street, and Montalban plays a Boston detective, and they use uh, forensic science to figure out who, who uh, killed this person. And it's kind of one of the first police procedurals to use, you know, uh, the CSI or Quincy kind right. of, you know, right. forensic, yeah, forensic science to uh, to find a killer. So there's that. And then he made a boxing movie called Right Cross, Montalban. Because Montalban was like, he was a badass. He was very physical and like in great shape. And as as he was always very proud to point out in Wrath of Khan with that it's big puffed up chest, it's like, yeah. no, that's actually his chest. Sorry. It's like, everyone's like, well, clearly that's the prosthetic. It's like, no, that's Ricardo Montalban. He was a badass, you know. I, guess I mean, it would, ju would have been just such a weird thing to do a prosthetic of, too, if he was just like, I want you to make my chest fuller, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, he had, some like sort of, he had some sort of degenerative muscul mus muscle disease, 
And the doctors told him, if you stay physically active, you're going to keep it at bay. And so he really did it for as long as he could. And so he really, and, he, and I remember hearing him say, yeah, I would do like, you know, a thousand sit-ups a day. But then for Khan, they really wanted to build up my chest. So I went to 2,000 sit-ups a day. And it's like, okay. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, not how that, that's not how that conversation would go with me. I would just be like, well, i get my affairs in order. <laughs> I guess <laughs> this is it. Well, I'm sitting um, on a couch right now for a reason. So, yes, I understand. <laughs> You know, oh, another yeah. cool one I saw is, uh, and this is definitely too horror for you, uh, to but we went to a, me and uh, Fialkov went to a Jallo festival before they shut the whole world down um, here in LA. And there's this movie pretty popular amongst like that kind of crowd. It's called Torso. Um, and it's directed, I think, by Sergio Martino. Uh, and I'm going to tell you what the twist is uh, because it's so cool. I mean, I don't know if I should, I'm going to tell you about it because. Tell me about it because you know I'm not going to say it. Yeah. So it's your basic, like, uh, (laughs) girls uh, on a, you know, like, school girls on a vacation, you know, like, college girls on a vacation get terrorized type movie. Um, But the twist is uh, they go up to this, like, uh, mansion, uh, like, up in the sticks that the, somebody has the keys to, or it's somebody's uncles or whatever. And the local people are like checking them out. Like, Oh, these girls, you know, and they're like, Oh, this is going to be trouble. Um, and then the one girl, uh, like they're goofing around and she sprains her ankle. And so she goes to bed early. And then when she, uh, when she wakes up, just the movie jumps ahead. And when she wakes up, everybody else in the house is dead. And so then, she's like she tries to leave this town and as she's leaving the town uh or no she doesn't she's still in the house like trying to figure out how to you know how to get out of there because she doesn't have a car and uh and the people the killers go back to town and they were like yeah we got those three girls and then the other people in town were like well there were four girls and then so now they're going back to find this one girl and she's like she knows she's in trouble but super crazy that they had this big you know like uh, violence, this bacchanal of violence that they just skip right over. Uh, this girl sprains her ankle and then she wakes up in the morning and it's just like chaos, you know, like s- that sort of narrative stuff. Super fun for me. Like I Absolutely. remember s- sitting there in the theater and just being like, what is happening? Like, you know, like you didn't expect it at all. It's great. Sorry that you guys will now expect it, but I recommend uh, torso by Sergio Martino. Anyway, it's <laughs> super fun. It's very That's cool. Fialkov called me uh, a couple nights ago. And we were talking, and he wanted to. He was he was nosing around a podcast idea, and that's good. I'm glad, man. I, I uh, they cracked me up. He and Christina, they're fantastic. Oh, so, the, the the one with Gable. Yes. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Yeah, and it's a great idea. I, honestly, I hope I hope they they are able to do it, and I and I hope it's good and everything. So, yeah. and uh, you briefly mentioned your wife. How are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing all right. Good, good deal, yeah. good deal. And I'm sorry, man. Are you quarantined? What's going on? Uh, I am quarantined as uh, I'm just terrified of the coronavirus. Oh yeah, so. <laughs> sure. Okay, you didn't catch anything. Yeah. Good. No, 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 no. Um, no, we're fine. Oh, I'm the same way, man. I know we're all yeah, I, we're all living in Charlton Heston's Omega Man life. You know, <laughs> yeah. Just let me go, uh, let me one, pour a fine brandy and enjoy some classical music while the crazy people are outside screaming. I I make myself go out once a week to take checks to the ATM, which I could definitely do on my phone but i was just like old fashioned uh and then i go to the comic book store which is uh if i die for going to the comic store i feel like that's appropriate enough you know like <laughs> <but> I'm, <laughs> I'm very careful in there like I, I keep my hands on my pocket i don't mess with anybody i don't try and get you know near anybody I understand. that's that's the most i go out otherwise i just order my food online i stay here in the house and luckily um i've had enough work that i just stay yeah i'm in the bubble <laughs> luckily i've had enough work that i can just stay here and do it and my landlords uh live out back of us so like they're probably like 15 feet from me right now just through like a, a sliding glass door oh wow uh, but i just imagine they just see me in here at all hours i used to work in a studio so they wouldn't see me at all now i'm just constantly you know bumbling around in here working yeah. on stuff yeah, yeah. Well, yeah but it's been you know like it's been good for productivity because without shows, you know, shows would take at least three days, usually like four days off of a week. And so yeah. you'd have to squeeze in all your other work in between those. And I was doing like 20 shows a year. And that really would add up. Sure. 
Yeah. No, I understand. Um, pony work? Any new pony work? Yeah. Well, outside of uh, Stray Dogs right now, they just solicited I'm um, drawing Rick and Morty. Oh, um, great. A mini series uh, that's written by this guy named Josh Trujillo uh, and co drawn uh, by this other guy, Jarrett Williams. Um, and it's basically like Rick and Morty uh, get split off into two different uh, adventures. And so I'm drawing the Morty part, and this guy Jarrett's drawing the Rick part. And cool. so the first issue is pretty much all me. And then the second and third issues, we're doing half, and the fourth, I think, we're all just doing half and half, and then they come back together in the end. That sounds um, amazing. That sounds. Incredible. And then I'm, and then My Little Pony Transformers just wrapped up. Congratulations, um, lovely. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, it was a long, a dream, uh, finally delivered on. That's uh, excellent. Like I've been, I've been begging them to do that thing for years, and we finally got to do it. Um, and then I have new pony stuff that I'm working on that'll solicit uh, next month. I'm doing another a two issue, uh, just a short two issue thing. Um, that sounds great. With, uh, with some characters from the My Little Pony movie that we haven't seen in a little while. Oh, very nice. So, Excellent. Yeah. Next month, like this month, uh, Stray Dogs and uh, Rick and Morty solicited the first issue of both of those. But next month, I'm going to have, I'm going to write, have you writing one uh, and drawing two, which is a, a definitely a first for me. I feel it feels like I've been very busy, but I've just been uh, like through COVID, like everything's been so stretched out that, you know, like some of the stuff we drew forever ago and it's just now finally coming out. But, well, I'm glad yeah, busy, it is, man. Busy times. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great. You know, the I dream. Uh, the attaboy. Very good. The book is called Stray Dogs. It is in uh, this current previews and it comes out in February. Um, anywhere to go website wise to, to look at it? Uh, yeah, we got a, a website, StrayDogsComic.com. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure it's updated for the people that watch this tomorrow. Uh, cool. Right now, it's just like a mailing list link. But yeah, it'll, it'll have all the information there. Uh, okay. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, uh, you can follow Trish Forstner on Twitter. Um, you should definitely check her out because she's always putting up artwork and stuff. Um, Absolutely. So, so yeah. Very cool. Tone, you'll forgive me. I got to cut this off because um, I'm getting called away. But uh, congratulations. And, uh, yeah, no let's, problem. We'll Thank you for having we'll, me on. Absolutely. Let me follow up with you on phone in a, in a minute or two. But, okay, uh, buddy. All right. Thank you. I'm going to wrap up right now. Tony Fleece, Thanks, everybody. Guys. Talk to you guys later. Stray Dogs, beautiful. And, uh, yeah, final word from uh, Patricia that our her issue of Pony will be out in December. That's great, Trish. Well done. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, stay safe. Stay happy. Stay healthy.